Great. Uh, thank you, Richard, for the kind introductions. Uh, should I sit down and talk? Maybe it's easier for me to flip. Is that OK? OK. <laughs> All right, uh, today I'll talk about the, uh, the China startup dream because um, I'm sure most of you are very interested in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in Asia. And the hottest area of entrepreneurship has to be China because uh, uh, China is an ever-changing story. It's a changing story of growth. So one thing you can be certain about China is that it will change. And people talk about it all the time. Every government that goes on um, since 1949 has been talking about reforms. And it's been reforming for the last 60, 70 years, uh, still reforming. So this is a very evolving story. So today I'll share some of my experiences um, starting a company, investing company in China. OK, the story starts from here. Uh, 1999 is when I graduated with a W degree. And I did my research work in uh, CIS, which is right next door. So I'm very familiar with uh, this area over here. Um, right after Stanford, I went back to China to start a company. And given the time of the, of the year, it was 1999. And the thing to do as a graduate from Stanford is to start a company. So I remember back in the time is that the graduating class of 1999, about 20% of the student body either started a company or joined a startup. So it was, uh, for those of, those of you who remember the times, it was a very, very exciting times. I still remember in 1999 attending a lot of lectures, similar to what you guys are listening to, hearing um, experiences from entrepreneurs, from investors from Sand Hill Road, sharing experiences of how to start a company, how to get an investment, how to develop, how to market. And I remember hearing um, the uh, two of the lectures I remember the most was uh, one from Tom Siebel, one of the founders of Oracle, which also started Siebel Systems, and another lecture in the GSB of uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, after that, that's when he gave the first lecture in Stanford after he returned to Apple. So hearing them sharing their experiences, I think that's one thing that struck me is that they're just ordinary people. And they weren't extraordinary. I mean, in, the, in their class or in their, when they started out starting the companies, they were very, very normal, very ordinary. But when they, what they have done is extraordinary. So that's one thing that struck me is that from these lectures, from these experiences that was being shared, is that if they can do something great from their ordinary beginnings, that anyone can. And so can I. I think that's one thing that I got most out of my Stanford experience, is that this confidence that we, anybody could change the world. So that's, that's one thing that perhaps after this lecture, after sharing my experiences, hopefully you get the same energy and same belief of same confidence that if I, if I can do it, so can you, to, to do something extraordinary. So I went back to China. That was the difference uh, from most of the, uh, the teams uh, that started companies here, is that I felt that uh, the internet boom was just starting in the United States. But I believe that, that this is going to be global, that everyone in the world will, be, will participate in this re internet revolution. So after, uh, um, when, after going back to China, to study the market with a couple of my classmates, uh, we decided that China was almost ripe to have to, to get into this uh, internet boom. Um, so we went back to China. As you can see, this, we started out um, this building. Uh, this is after we got our funding that we moved into this building. This uh, uh, number 66 uh, on the Nandi Shi Road. We chose that building because the, there's two other Stanford companies inside. One is Cisco, another one is Sun, Sun Microsystems. So we chose that building because we felt that it, it must have some good luck to it, being, being close to these two, uh, two Stanford-funded companies. So we started a company in China. We raised our funding from Goldman Sachs, uh, KKR, and uh, 
Joho Capital from New York, that we ended up raising $15 million from these uh, uh, two, two rounds, Series A and Series B, out of these three funds. And uh, in 1999, you know, the, the time is that um, everyone was talking about the new economy. Nobody really cared about revenues or profits. So it ended up that we spent $15 million, acquired a lot of users, and we were very good at it. So um, we were talking to our investors that about if we don't get any revenue or if we just spend all of these investments on user acquisitions and product development, what's going to happen to us in the future? And our investors were telling us that it's a new economy and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> and all we have to do is just uh, keep on doing what we do best, which is acquire users, and we can go public on NASDAQ. So we're very excited, and we're ready to go on NASDAQ, and we're, because Goldman Sachs was our uh, Series A investor. So they were talking, the, the banking people were talking to us about uh, listing. Then everybody knew that in 2000, the market crashed, and uh, that IPO hopes were gone. And Goldman was telling us that we're not going to get any more funding, and we got to sell the company. So we sold the company in September of 2000. Uh, that was only a little over a year from the beginning of the company to, to the time of acquisition. And at the time of the acquisition, the, a lot of companies wanted to acquire us, including many of the U.S. companies, because we were the fourth largest website in, chi in China in terms of traffic. And the, the website is very young, but in terms of traffic, it was very, very uh, high traffic website. Uh, the, the, the site was a, a community-based site. It was called community back then. Today, we would call it a social network. <laughs> but uh, this term wasn't even coined yet. Uh, we ended up selling to another, uh, one of the listed companies from China. It was called Sohu. Uh, it was the second largest uh, internet property in China uh, at the time. So they acquired us. And I was in Sohu for a year and a half. But because I was an entrepreneur by heart, that, of course, I left the company to start my uh, second venture, which uh, Richard has uh, introduced, which uh, listed on NASDAQ after two and a half, two, about two and a half years from beginning to IPO, which was in the space of mobile internet. It was very early age, early times for mobile internet. It wasn't even called mobile internet back then. It was called uh, wireless VAS, value added services, uh, ringtones, Java games, if you remember those things, coloring back tones, et cetera. And the, but Kongzhong, which was the second company, it was the largest in, in China in that field. So sharing some of the experiences uh, from 1999 is that there was lots of obstacles to entrepreneurship in China. The first of all is that China just joined that WTO, but still, uh, many industries were close to foreign as well as private capital, including the telecom industry. Internet was considered a part of the telecom industry. And especially foreign capital was, uh, um, was a no-no in this, in this area. And angel investing, venture capital, and private equity were non-existent. Non-existent. That, that concept of investing in private companies were very foreign, very strange in China in, in, in 1999. So most of the most of the companies had to do was to borrow money to start companies. So lending, either from banks or from individuals, was the primary source of funding for most startups in China. Uh, it was very difficult to attract quality employees because most people want to work for foreign 500 uh, foreign companies, or they want to work for state-owned enterprises because most people, most of the employees, the qualified employees, want stability instead of the uh, sort of like, if you are an entrepreneur, then they don't know that whether, how long you can last. So they, they'd rather not work for a startup. And also the lack of infrastructure for IT development. Um, ISPs, internet service providers, were almost non-existent. Uh, the data centers were very, very crude. Uh, I remember that uh, when we were starting our website, we have to, the, the, the building was very, very, um, very bad condition building. And that was the center of internet for China. 
and the elevators doesn't even work, so we have to carry the servers on the stairs. I was carried with the engineers, so we have to have strong muscles <laughs> as network administrators. Uh, again, there was a huge information asymmetry across the Pacific. So most, I had to bring a lot of books on Java programming, PHP, MySQL, etc., to to back to China because um, even those texts on internet programming was lacking. So most of the employees don't even know how how to um, make work of the internet technologies. So these were a lot of the obstacles for entrepreneurs in China back in 1999. The most uh, the, the 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 biggest obstacle toward entrepreneurship, especially in the internet field, is that foreign capital is not allowed in the China internet space. Ah, that was a big problem because uh, we raised our capital from the United States, right? Our angel investor was from Silicon Valley. Uh, our VC, Goldman Sachs, <laughs> uh, KKM, a partnership fund of KKR, et cetera, they're all foreign capital. So that was the problem. And this, this sign is, um, it was called the uh, Ministry of Information Industries. It was, it was the governing body of the telecom industry as well as the internet. And the minister has said that foreign capital is not allowed specifically. So we had to cope with the obstacles. First of all, we, we didn't necessarily want to raise foreign capital, but we raised foreign capital out of necessity because there was no venture capital in China or private equity in China back in 1999. It was very, very lacking. So most of the, uh, uh, there was two, uh, then again, um, there, there was two types of entrepreneurs in China in the internet space. One is called the returnees, or uh, in Chinese, the, the word is called returnee sea turtles, uh, hai gui. The other, uh, other uh, group of entrepreneurs was the locals, or the aborigines, or whatever, these uh, uh, local um, uh, entrepreneurs. And in, Chi in Chinese, they were called tu bie. <laughs> means means uh, these land, lowly land turtles. <laughs> Where the uh, uh, gao da shang, which is a uh, high end, you know, the sea turtles, which are very big, you know, returning sea turtles. These are the local turtles, small local turtles. Uh, I was talking to um, um, the uh, Zhou Hongyi, which is the, the founder for 360, also a public company, very, very big uh, internet guy. I was uh, eating lunch with him the other day, and he was talking to me, saying that, you know, back in the days, you guys raised so much capital, you paid the employees so much, and you approached so many people, and you're making it really difficult for us because we cannot raise capital. <laughs> Zhou Hongyi, you know, for, for Mr. Zhou, that because he doesn't speak English, he went to a local university, and he doesn't have access to Sand Hill Road. <laughs> or to other uh, foreign capital, that it was very difficult for them. So they had really have to bootstrap and scrap uh, to, to make ends meet as, a, as an entrepreneur. So most of the capitals were raised by these returnee entrepreneurs because they speak very good English. And there was one exception uh, of these local entrepreneurs, or the two bie, which he raised a lot of capital. Uh, Although he never went to uh, the, the United States for schooling, but he did, he did speak very good English. Uh, his name is Ma Yun, <laughs> Jack Ma. The reason is that he used to be an English teacher. <laughs> so he was the only one of the locals who could raise a lot of money. Otherwise, all of them had to scrap, and they had to succeed on their own. Even uh, Pony Ma of Tencent, which is, everybody knows that he's, they, are, they are the biggest internet property in China today, and he could not get funding at all. He got about $250,000 from IDG, and that was about all the venture capital he's got. <laughs> and uh, so he, he always wanted to sell the company because he could not make ends meet. He could not pay his employees back in the time. We, were, we raised about $15 million, and this guy raised about $250,000. So um, that was the time. So raising foreign capital was out of necessity. Uh, we found talented hires directly from top universities. I remember going to Tsinghua 
and uh, almost poached their entire uh, computer science department. All the students, almost, almost half of them worked for uh, our startup company. And a lot, a lot of them just skipped classes and they just worked for us because we paid them very, very well. <laughs> and almost like full-time employees. Uh, we use the information as asymmetry as an advantage because uh, can I ask you a quick question? Okay. So I thought you said all of them wanted to work at like SOEs or these big yeah. companies. Yeah. Yeah. So why did these guys want to work at? Because we were in school. So they were still in school. So we actually we started out our company with almost more than half of our, our staff are part timers. I see. Okay. <laughs> so they were in school anyways. So they cannot work with SOEs or foreign companies. So they work for us in part time. But ended up they liked us so much that they skipped a lot of classes. They work almost as full time <laughs> working for us. <laughs> so ended up the uh, the director of the uh, the computer science department uh, actually contacted us, uh, had a meeting with us, saying that we cannot do this. <laughs> they found that their classrooms are being emptied out, <laughs> and they heard of this company right outside Tsinghua <laughs> that uses all the, all their students. But it's a good thing that uh, because Tsinghua is very selective, highly selective university in China, so the, the kids who go into there are very smart, so they learn very quickly uh, how to program, how the internet technology, et cetera. So it, it worked out very, very well. So we use information asymmetry as an advantage because we are the returnees, so we know a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the, the technologies and the business models from the US. And we're just bringing it back to China. And a lot of uh, the locals don't know about it. And uh, not much we can do about infrastructure development except to wait for the wave to come. And it did come. <laughs> so China has uh, built massively rollout of these uh, internet as well as wireless internet infrastructures. The solution we had for foreign capital is not unique. Okay, Most of the companies went public on in the US I'll use this structure, it's called the VIE structure. Variable uh, interest entities. Uh, if you invest in Chinese uh, ADRs, or the, the listed Chinese companies in the United States, they all use this the VIE structure. Which means that uh, in order to bypass the rule made by the Ministry of Information Industries, so, so you have to separate the license holder from the investment or the ownership. So there's an onshore company, which holds all the licenses, uh, which does the operation of the internet business in China. And there's an offshore uh, vehicle, which uh, holds all the investment. So the offshore includes foreign investors and the, and the founders of the companies. And the onshore is 100% owned, uh, owned by the founders, which is the domestic uh, uh, team. So, so these two uh, entities do not have any ownership binding, and they're controlled only by contractual agreements. And according to the US GAAP, and also the, the rules by the SEC, they recognize that the VIE structure is OK for listing in the US. This is a, this is a typical structure. Although this, uh, the SEC sometimes come up with a challenge, you read in the news, they said, ah, VIE structure is not OK. And they, they, then the, uh, the accounting firms work with them. After a while, they say it's OK again. Or they say it's not OK. And the Chinese government sometimes said it's not OK. Then they work with them, and they said it's OK again. So this VIE structure, it's a temporary solution. And it's sort of, it's like a Band-Aid. <laughs> it's not a perfect solution, but it, it sort of works out for the, for the time being. And the goal for most of the companies, uh, the startup companies in China, for a very long time, was to IPO on NASDAQ or NYSE. But NASDAQ was more popular in the early days, in the, around the 2000, early, early parts of the last decade. But now NYSE is becoming more popular because they're doing a better job at attracting um, high-tech companies. So Kongzhou, which is my uh, second company, Alibaba, Jing, uh, JD, Jingdong, Baidu, and et cetera, et cetera. Many, many of the companies uh, were listed in the US. And that was a, that was a goal. 
Otherwise, being acquired is another exit for most of the companies in China. But things changed a lot in 2015 today. Like I said in the beginning, China is a evolving story. And things change a lot in just the last half a year. So today, I think the re remaining part of my lecture is to share with you what happened in the last couple of years. First of all, there's plenty of funding sources in China. I believe there's more funding sources in China than there are here in Silicon Valley. Uh, all the international VCs, all the international PE funds have set up shops in China, and they have hired locally, or either locally or returnees uh, to fill up their shops. And uh, many domestic shops have grown to dominate the investment space. And domestic investments actually outpaced foreign investment in China today. And as a startup in China, remember I said before that you have to speak English to be able to raise capital? Now, all of your investment PowerPoint, the business plan, has to be written in Chinese to show that you are very local. If you, if you show up to a VC with an English business plan, you will be thrown out because they feel that you're not local at all. <laughs> so uh, things have changed, changed a lot in the funding sources. The information chasm has been totally filled, and returnees have no information advantage. And they talk about, uh, you heard about uh, the copy to China, about how a lot of these business models in, in, in the United States, when they become popular, they're being copied over to China. Today, there's more entrepreneurs in China than there are in the United States. So all of the business models, all of the, everything that can be copied is copied, whether it's, it's, it's popular or not. So the, 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 the joke is that when YC, Y Combinator, has a demo day, a lot of these entrepreneurs in China, they, 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 uh, they actually stay late at night. They don't go to sleep. They watch, watch it live, <laughs> live broadcast. Twitter, pictures, video. <laughs> and uh, whenever a new company gets featured, like, just <laughs> in, a, in a couple weeks, a copycat comes up <laughs> in China. So the demo day for, for, uh, for Y Combinator is a big event. So China is forced to innovate. Why? Because there's no, nothing to copy. You, you have to innovate. You have to come up with something new. Because every sector, every niche, is totally filled. Uh, government is very, very pro-entrepreneurship. This government, uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, Premier Li Keqiang, uh, is very, very pro-entrepreneurship. Uh, it's using resources to promote entrepreneurship and innovation in a very unprecedented way. Never before has China been so pro-entrepreneurship. Because, uh, you know, back in the old days, People talk about in the Chairman Mao's age that entrepreneurship is being uh, disdained, that being an entrepreneur is uh, capitalism, right? With uh, Deng Xiaoping it's opening up the, uh, the country with reforms, it's allowing market economy, but never before that uh, the government is so pro-business, so pro-entrepreneurship, it's sometimes people say that it's scary how, how much they're promoting this. Uh, in China, the trend is that everyone is becoming an entrepreneur. In this day and age, I can say that China has many, many more entrepreneurs than the Silicon Valley or the United States in, in total. So I, I estimate, I guess, about in the United States um, right now, currently, entrepreneurs is about maybe a few hundred thousand entrepreneurs in the United States. But in China, it's way more than a million. Perhaps there's a few million in the coming, coming years of entrepreneurs. If you talk to young people everywhere in China, they're talking about starting companies. If you go to universities, they talk about starting companies. It's, it's amazing how everyone has this entrepreneurial dream. So remember before I said it's very hard to recruit people to work in your startup companies? Now you have another problem, that your employees want to start up companies. <laughs> they want to leave. <laughs> this is a picture of the premier of the new government, uh, Premier Li Keqiang. 
and uh, he has uh, his key message uh, during the uh, for for his administration is a da zhong chuang ye wan zhong chuang xin, which uh, translation into English is that mass entrepreneurship and innovation. Everyone knows that entrepreneurship is belongs to a minority, right? Usually that uh, a few of the people want to struck out, want to start something new, want to enter the brave new world. That's entrepreneurship, right? It usually it's, a, it's, a, it's some, doing something different. It's a minority thing. It's not mainstream. But in China, it's mass entrepreneurship, meaning that it's mainstream to be an entrepreneur. So vast number of people are starting companies. That's perhaps a lot of them shouldn't be starting companies, right? <laughs> they're, they're not ready, they're not prepared, they're not even fit to be an entrepreneur. But that doesn't stop them starting companies. And the government is pro pro promoting that. They're saying that entrepreneurship should be for everyone. And you're finding entre entrepreneurship in many different places. If you look at this, this is uh, the, the broadcast into uh, it's a news news story that in the 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 farms that uh, these farm ladies are studying because uh, the Fu Lian, which is the, the the women's association of the of the county, <laughs> is holding up seminars teaching these women to start companies selling goods, <laughs> and is is promoted as a news news story. So all of the governments, the provincial government, the municipalities, have uh, are ordered to promote entrepreneurship. It's amazing how many uh, incubators are starting up, and how many uh, entrepreneurial contests were held by various ministries. So many ministries are holding up these uh, entrepreneurial contests. Uh, one, currently, the, the major uh, entrepreneur contest was held by the Department of Human Resources, Ministry of Human Resources, Ren Shebu. And they're holding a uh, contest, uh, entrepreneurial contest, like the TechCrunch, sort of like the, the TechCrunch type of entrepreneurial contest, in all of the provinces, including provinces like Gansu, <laughs> Ningxia, or Xinjiang. You know, these provinces, which is like almost desert. Almost, there's no, almost nobody there, and they're ordered to hold these contests. So they, even these provinces with very few people, they are holding these entrepreneurial contests. So in the, all the cities, all the towns, all the municipalities are promoting entrepreneurship. There's incubators everywhere. Even I'm building an incubator <laughs> in my hometown in Xi'an, which the, the government is... Uh, giving me uh, resources of uh, a huge building, very low rent, if I can fill it up. The, the, my, uh, my KPI is to, to make this place uh, booming with entrepreneurs. That's all I have to do. And the government will give me this building with furnished, fully furnished building with very low, low rent, much lower than the, uh, the, the, the given the local rate, just so that I can promote entrepreneurship in Xi'an because that, that was my hometown and also the hometown of President Xi Jinping. So, uh, so the, 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 the mayor is uh, very uh, keen on this. So they want to build, make sure that Xi'an is not lacking behind <laughs> in entrepreneurship. Even the, um, the education department, education ministry, have issued orders to all the universities in China. Last year, they have issued an order, uh, filing Wen Jian, saying that uh, if any student in your universities want to start a company, the universities have to allow them to suspend their education and go to start a company, meaning that they can come back anytime to finish their studies. You have to let them go. If they want to go, just let them go and start a company and, make, and keep their uh, school records. So it, for example, take a sabbatical so they can come back anytime to finish their studies. I thought usually only Stanford allowed this, right? But most of the universities don't. But uh, in China, the, the ministry is making sure that every university is doing that. And uh, just a few weeks ago, the ministry have issued a new order saying that the university students starting companies will be counted toward their credits. 
to go <laughs> for graduation. <laughs> now you know the government in China is very serious on um, promoting entrepreneurship. I don't think Stanford allows that, right? No? Generally, you've got to do something different. you got to do something different? If you, if you uh, suspend your education, just uh, take a leave. You don't get credit. You don't get credit? No. Uh, in China, you do. Yeah. <laughs> you do get credit for taking a leave and start a company. So now you know how, how things are, are working. So things have changed a lot in just this half a year. Equity investment is red hot in private and secondary markets. The stock boom recently have ignited the country, and everyone's investing, either in primary market or secondary market. Um, I believe the effects are spilling over to foreign markets, because including myself, I'm coming over here to Silicon Valley to invest in startups here. The reason is because the valuation here is just so cheap compared to comparable companies in China. And every, everyone heard about the housing prices, right, in the, in the Bay Area being, being uh, increased by the Chinese buyers of these houses. Well, there's a huge gap between the, the prices uh, of houses and companies, right? They, they say that uh, the price you pay for a house in the United States is the price you pay for a bathroom in Beijing. <laughs> that's what you, that's talked about the housing price differences. And the same thing with startup companies, is that you look at these companies, wow, it has great technology, great products. The valuation is so cheap compared to the comparable companies in China. So what happens is that a lot of the VCs, angel investors, funds, are all coming to Silicon Valley to invest in a very big way because they feel that things here are just so cheap. So, um, I believe the bubble effect is actually spilling over. So prices here is going to, going to, going to move up because of the, the bubble effect of China. The, the company valuations have skyrocketed. Many companies got rid of the VIE structure to list back in the Chinese stock exchanges. So this is happening. Remember before, in the first part of my lecture, that the goal of the startup companies to list in the United States on NASDAQ and uh, NYSE, now, no way. <laughs> For the companies who already have the VIE structures, they have a huge headache of thinking of ways to get rid of these foreign investors. Before, foreign investors are our friends. Now, foreign investors are our enemy because that's the obstacle to listing in, ch in, in the Chinese stock market. So they have to buy out these foreign investors. So a lot of these entrepreneurs talk to the foreign investors, like, look, you know, we're not doing very well, so and so, whatever, <laughs> trying to get them to sell to the, to the Chinese investors to make sure that their, the structure is very clean. So they want to get rid of the VI structures. Before, you remember the bickering between the US government and Chinese government about whether the legality of the VI structure? That's, that's a non-issue non anymore. It's not an issue anymore because, um, the companies don't want it. <laughs> They're voluntarily giving up the VIE structure <laughs> to, to be able to list in the Chinese stock markets. Even the companies that's already listed on NASDAQ, a lot of them are, are trying to get privatized, Try, trying, to, uh, trying to delist, trying to get out of the NASDAQ or the NYSE uh, delist, and then move back to China listing on the Chinese stock market. Because the the valuations on the Chinese stock market are just very, very high. Uh, when you list, you get about 30 to 40 uh, PE. The PE ratio is about 30 to 40. And after a few months, you can usually get up to around 100. The average PE ratio for the listed company is around 60 today. And it's still rising. The average is still rising. So it's amazing. So uh, most of these companies are like, why would I want to list on NASDAQ and get about 15 to 20 PE ratio when I, get, when I can get 60 PE ratio on the Chinese stock market? And because the President Xi Jinping and the President Li Keqiang is uh, reforming the, the equities market in China, that perhaps in the future, that even the, the foreign capital invested company, the VIE structure, can list on the uh, Chinese stock market. They're, they're considering the issue. And I, I take one step further. Maybe eventually 
that Chinese stock market will allow foreign companies to list on the Chinese stock market. So startups in Silicon Valley can list in China because you get much better valuations. So more money for less dilution. Why not, right? So just like when the Chinese company wants to list in the US, maybe in the future, they want to list in the Chinese stock market and raise money there in the Chinese equities market. So the introduction of the third board have gotten many more companies into the public market very quickly instead of getting a big PE round. So China has went ahead with very advanced reforms in the equities uh, market is that the, in the introduction of a third board. A third board is a board that's um, even more aggressive than NASDAQ. Because NASDAQ in China, China has a main board, uh, a Chuang Yiban, which is similar to NASDAQ. Now they introduce a third board, which compete with the PEs, has a much less uh, bar, uh, bar to be able to list on the third board. So most of the companies in China after the VC round today, they're not going for a PE round. <laughs> they go to public directly on the third board because the valuations are much better. And you have less of, uh, because the, the, you, usually you get a big PE firm and that's very bothersome to your operations. And if you list on, on the public market, usually you, you feel um, you have less, um, uh, you feel freer on the, on the public market. And China's considering a fourth board, even more aggressive, even lower bar than the third board, meaning that it's actually uh, going to compete with the VCs. So in the future, perhaps that after angel round, after you do it for a while, you can get listed right away on the fourth board. Instead of going to VC to raise money, you can just go to the public market to raise money. So um, what the fourth board is going to compete with is most of these crowd, uh, equity crowdfunding uh, platforms. Because in China right now, there's a lot of equity um, crowdfunding platforms. But the government feels that um, if it's allowed to uh, many of the private pl platforms to exist, then it will be highly unregulated. It will be uh, probably going to be a mess. But perhaps the government will be uh, the biggest crowdfunding platform there is with the fourth board. <laughs> so, so perhaps there will be no need for VCs. So every, everyone has to evolve. Even the VC firms have to evolve. The investors have to evolve in this new day and age. So everything is being disrupted today in the China's uh, startup scene. So I said a lot of things that's good about the China, uh, the, the China about starting up a company in China. But the last slide, I'll talk to you about the harsh realities of starting com uh, up companies in China. The competition in Chinese startup scene is so fierce that every niche market is filled with companies. Like I said, everything's been copied, and every niche market is filled with tons of companies. In the US, usually a niche market has about maybe five, six, and most 10 companies. In China, every niche market has over 100 companies doing every niche, every small niche you can think of, because there's so many entrepreneurs working on everything. So the competition is so fierce that everyone works extremely hard. The because uh, I I also invest in companies here in the Silicon Valley, right? A lot of the entrepreneurs in here, in the Bay Area, they like to start companies in San Francisco. I asked them why. They said because, on Friday night, you know, San Francisco, you can go to a bar, chill with friends. On Saturday and Sundays, you know, you have a life. I was like. You guys have weekends here <laughs> in China as a startup. You don't have weekends. And you work super late into the night because the competition is so fierce. And even investors, the competition is very fierce. I work extremely hard too, fighting for deals, looking through companies. So everyone in China works extremely, extremely hard. That's why when you compare the companies here, they develop so slowly, but in China, things move at a much, much faster pace. As one example, if you look at the Apple Store, right, the, the, the apps, in the US, an app gets updated about every two months. In China, an app gets updated every two weeks. You see that you constantly have these apps being updated. 
in the, in the App Store because just, they just program me away. Every two weeks to release the version. And they say that, oh my god, your app hasn't been updating for over a month. <laughs> that's, that's unheard of. When you do an app, you have to update it every two weeks. And the bug fixes, feature improvements, product, product improvements, whatever, just update it every two weeks. You've got to have improvement every two weeks. And that's the, the fierceness of the competition. The freemium model is not enough. You see, they talk about the internet that you give out stuff for free, right? In China, if you, if you go out and give something for free, you have no market because everyone gives it out for free. <laughs> so in order to compete, you have to pay for users to use your product. You have to give them, in Chinese, it's called hongbao, fa hongbao. It's called red packets. For example, like Uber in the US, right? You use Uber and they don't pay you to use Uber. You know, it's just, you use it. In China, even Uber coming to China, they learned to give red packets. And Uber gave a lot of red packets <laughs> to users to use Uber service. So basically, you ride Uber in China today, it's almost free and you can make money too. By riding Uber, you can actually make money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fierceness of Chinese competition. That's why you, you know how Chinese companies are very competitive, right? They're very, very competitive everywhere globally. Um, everyone's working long, gruesome hours. And you require constant fundraising because you're giving away a lot of red packets. So in the US, people talk about the burn rate that will last about 24 months, 36 months of burn rate after one round of fundraising. In China, they talk about six months burn rate. You see, so you're constantly fundraising as an entrepreneur. So besides running your business, that's why these guys work for long, gruesome hours. Besides working, and they have to fundraise all the time. So you need to know how to market and promote really well since it's very difficult to be heard. With so many people, so many voices, so many noises, being able to let your product, let your company to be heard, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So um, it's basically a jungle out there. So yeah, anyone wants to start a company in China, this is what's happening, right? Last, uh, a few days ago, I had a, uh, in Beida, Beijing University, we had a dialogue with Peter Thiel. And uh, we're talking about uh, investments in Silicon Valley and in China. And I was telling Peter that I don't think you can survive in China <laughs> investing <laughs> because Chinese entrepreneurs and Chinese uh, investors are alike. It's very, very ferocious. I use the word ferocious. <laughs> OK, I'll end my talk here. Oh, we'll that's keep, right. We'll Thank next. you, Nick. <laughs> I can imagine there's a lot of questions from the audience. If anyone want to start, go ahead. From the way you describe it, how are any of these companies going to ever be successful? In China? Yeah. And they're all, the competition is fierce. Everybody yeah. is developing the same uh -huh. product. Yeah. They're giving away. It's you negative know the one that can survive. <laughs> sure. How do they survive? The one that can survive is the strongest wolf out of the pack. <laughs> That's how, that's how things can succeed. I don't know, because the companies I invest in, some are very good teams, very top quality uh, entrepreneurs, but they got eaten. <laughs> no, nothing I can do. So the ones that, that can survive are the toughest ones, are the best. Actually, I saw two hands first before okay. you. So back in the back, you, and then you, and then you, OK? I uh, know you're more of an expert than me, but I'm sniffing that I've heard this story before. Mm -hmm. In 1999 here, mm -hmm. uh, 2000, mm -hmm. when or if or what do you see about the where this goes? Does it continue forever, or is there some mm -hmm. limit to the height of trees going to the sky? No, I think it's um, in, the, in the short term, short to medium term. I believe there will be a correction, but in the long term, you will see that it's only a dip. <laughs> By the dip, huh? It's like, look at, look at Amazon, the stock price of Amazon, right? It used to be like this, then now it's like there. <laughs> look at so Apple. Do you think the dip will be right. as big as the dip here in 2000? Perhaps. 
but it's okay. But, but know, remember, term, remember, term Google and Facebook and all these companies are all post two thousand, right? Yeah, if you They're look at the, Apple, if you look at yeah. Google, if you look at how much the, the entire internet has transformed our world, that entire valuation combined of these companies, that that's only a dip. But you're coming here to invest, right? I'm not coming here to invest because the bubble will spread here as well. <laughs> I saw you. Well, that was a little bit of my question. I wasn't sure in your speech whether or not you're concentrating on investing in China or you're investing here with your angel fund. Uh, mostly in China, but uh, I do invest here because uh, um, I invest in technology because that's what I like. I have a W background, and I invest. The two areas I invest in is one is artificial intelligence, smart devices, and smart life or smart everything. And the two is uh, advanced bio. Any other countries besides China and the United States you're looking at now? No, because these two countries are only, only two countries that's interesting. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> maybe you have to some other countries. <laughs> so, based on what you said, what would be actually like the blue ocean technology that you think will have a breakthrough, right? When everybody uh, smart everything, artificial intelligence. Okay, and is that something that? I would think the smart intelligence will be something reiteration, and that seems to be that what. No, no. no what, what, what I believe is that because uh, if you look at the AI technology that we use today, it's been around for. Decades, right? It, uh, the, 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 the sensor technologies, the chips, it's all been around for decades. The reason why we're entering a new age of the smart age is because the prices have been dropped significantly. And it's finally ready for mass appeal. So that's what I believe, is we're going to enter a new age. Uh, the internet age is about age of information disruption, right? The, we have seen that for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, maybe 20, around 20 years of internet development. But right now, we're in the, in the beginning of a new era, or new epoch, is that um, the age of smart devices. It's because uh, the age of distributed intelligence, and this is what I truly believe. So I'm invest heavily into this area. Okay, I saw a couple of hands over here first. Ken, you go first. Well, I I have many questions, but I could ask most of them later. I guess not to get into anyone else. Um, what is a typical burn rate that, that you typically see in China versus what the burn rates are, say, in San Francisco? Okay, uh, the burn rates, it's uh, no matter how much money you raise, you should burn it in six months. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the burn rate. <laughs> so if, you, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not paying employees, you should give out red packets to, to, <laughs> to get customers. <laughs> we'll start with you and go that way, OK? Go ahead. You were talking about the, those Chinese companies that want to go to NASDAQ, want to uh, go public in China. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, the PE ratio mm -hmm. evaluation higher, but mm -hmm. why just recently the Alibaba and the uh, Uber, uh, uh, a while ago, Sina go to NASDAQ? Why? That was before. That was before. This is only this half year. But Alibaba is only half. Yeah, half years ago wasn't this hot. I'm talking about things so change very fast in China. So if <laughs> Alibaba didn't go to uh, NASDAQ uh, half year ago, he won't do anymore? Uh, Alibaba perhaps um, had political issues as well, but uh, it's, uh, it's not a, um, it's more of an exception than the rule. So I'm talking about more ex-Alibaba so market. So continuous question. A lot of companies are delisting on NASDAQ. Okay, so if Alibaba go to the China star market, will it work more than now? Uh, that's speculation because it would, it, uh, you cannot speculate on what happens. I, I, I told you, Alibaba, ex-Alibaba market. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to hear finally AI is oh. into a, a, uh -huh. a big show. Um, I'm interested, do you have any uh, focus on which industries you think the way we're here? AI? Yeah. All industries. We're going to be surrounded by intelligence. It's an age of distributed intelligence. People talk about the cloud, you know, with the uh, uh, cloud technology, with the internet. I don't really believe in the cloud because I believe in distributed intelligence, meaning that the intelligence should be local around you rather than be in the cloud. Because with the cloud is not responsive, the latency, you know, with the, uh, also the, the reliability of the cloud is, it will never 
be fully uh, which everyone would believe because the transmission technology, the networking evolved, penetrating walls. There's a physical limitation to the cloud. But with distributed intelligence, meaning that intelligence uh, will work around you. These chips being around you, like the smartwatch, although this is pretty crappy. <laughs> I, I, if, if Jobs was alive, I don't think he would release this. But uh, still, it's a start. <laughs> As we continue, you go first, okay? Quick question. You might have a perspective on this. I'm hoping you do. I have a team of developers in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and there's an explosion of companies, mm -hmm. Chinese companies, in Ethiopia and uh, Eastern and Western Africa. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is do you think this climate of competition has pushed the uh, entrepreneurs in China to look internationally yeah, for have. other opportunities? They have. In Southeast Asia them? as well, in Vietnam, <laughs> Myanmar. As well as uh, Africa, yeah. My point is, they're competing with the local local teams yeah. in those areas because they they've come with this aggressive attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're, they 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 feel that they cannot survive in China. That's, that's kind of my point. Okay, we're gradually getting this way. Go ahead, you first. I'm at a complete loss to understand where the real money is coming from. Is the wealth that has been hidden in China sufficient? to set up the VC funds, the private equity funds. You, you mean the source of form. capital? Pardon? Source yeah. of money? Yeah. 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 Oh, this goes into the, the capitalism theory of how money exists and how the government, you know, create money out of the GDP. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a long discussion. <laughs> Money just come out with somewhere, right? You know, <laughs> you know the, the Chinese central bank <laughs> creation of GDP value increases. You know, pumps into the market, Q, quantitative easing. So we don't worry about that. We just see the effects. Okay, I'm an engineer. I'm not a physicist. <laughs> What's your insight? <laughs> what? Oh, okay, sure. Okay. There are two people here, go ahead. What is your insight? I think uh, I heard the incentive of doing this in China is diminishing. Like what? they are, the, for example, the labels are very expensive today, compared with years ago. Mm -hmm. And actually, I heard that the last year, 2014, the small business, they start, they have very difficult surviving period. And mm -hmm. I, I heard that's the reason why the government is pushing trying to support small because small business. Yeah, a lot of yeah. policies coming. Yeah. The, the, the reason traditional is industry is hurting. That's why a lot of unemployment. <laughs> and a lot of uh, college students don't get jobs after graduation. So the government really want people to start companies. Do you think Creation. the trend is what? slowing or what? For the Chinese entrepreneur entrepreneurship group is the trend is slowing down. No, 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 it's, it's increasing. <laughs> it's increasing. So more and more people want to be entrepreneurs. Because there's um, uh, in the uh, in the Chinese uh, internet, one of the uh, uh, resignation letter uh, was very popular, and uh, it said um, the res reason for resignation is that the world is so big. I want to go see it. <laughs> no, I'm nothing to do with uh, the company. You know, I like it very much. You know, nothing to do with the boss. You know, you're very nice. <laughs> no, just the world's very big. I want to see it. <laughs> So we're continuing around in this direction. You first, and then you, okay? Uh, uh, this talk seemed to be uh, related to uh, entrepreneurial and technology. Mm -hmm. does, does that carry over to uh, uh, new ideas for uh, a fancy back scratcher or a, a better tasting soy sauce? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Are you talking about the, uh, the premier, Li Keqiang, saying the mass entrepreneurship? He's yeah. saying entrepreneurship in anything. Right. You just you can open up a small restaurant. It's still government promotes that as well. Just anything. It's not just in high tech. Is, is, is it booming just as much as in high tech? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everywhere. I first heard Esther Dyson ask this question. If everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, who will work for them? <laughs> <laughs> the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was heard on TV, but the yeah. Americans will work for them. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm sure there's many people who want to work for them. Because uh, I'm, I'm telling you that, uh, for example, uh, Chinese entrepreneurship may be risen to over a million entrepreneurs, right? That's still very little compared to the entire population. Well, they still Even that, five million, that's still very low. 
they still need to learn somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. Small business exists, yeah. or yeah. large business exists to yeah. create the small business yeah. of tomorrow. So it's it's where they learn, and yeah. then they. The, the problem is with the quality people, you know, the people who are the vice presidents, you know, the, the directors. These are the guys leaving the company. That actually hurts more than just regular employees. And that's happening everywhere. Go ahead. You mentioned technology. Now, technology isn't just the internet and, you know, software based. Would it, how does it translate into the medical technology? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, medical technologies? Uh, there's some, um, uh, with the information uh, uh, revolution with the internet, uh, and means transform the medical industry a lot, especially with big data, especially with uh, uh, also with smart devices, intel distributed intelligence, et cetera. Um, on the medical side, I'm not a expert on that. Uh, I, I said uh, I invest in advanced biotechnology. It's more on genetic engineering and these, these areas. I must say. Great. Back in the back. Not medical. Wow. If you were to predict the next three to five years, what do you think will be the success rate? Success rate of you know, the Chinese entrepreneurs? Yes. I think maybe 95% fail, 97%. <laughs> Roughly. That on, uh, I mean, fail as uh, like they have to close, close shop. About 5% will exist in long term entity. Uh, but it's okay because yes. uh, it, you know why? Because um, in entrepreneurship, you never lose. Whether you win or lose, you won. <laughs> you won a valuable experience, right, in your lifetime. And you're saying that as an angel investor, right? Yeah. yeah. These are people using your money. Yeah, it's okay. Because uh, if you see one in 20, right? If, okay. I, if I invest uh, evenly among them, yeah. if I get a 20 bagger, yeah, that's, okay. that's break even. I mean, obviously, yeah, okay. the, the winner is more than 20 times. Yeah, okay. So, so you, you play the, uh, the, uh, the odds game. Long. Go ahead. You've been patient. So, I'm, I don't understand. You say that people over there work a long hour and uh, no weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, at the same time, a lot of people have low job. Mm -hmm. A lot of gra new graduates have no job. That's why government has promoted those uh, uh, yeah. standard up. So, why... Why people just you and the other your employee just work less hour have weekend and hire more of those people <laughs> <in> your job? <laughs> I, I, I don't think the, the, most companies want to work that way. Why? Why? Because the more people you have, the more problems you have. <laughs> people are not robots. Actually, if, can, if I can follow up on that, you haven't really talked a lot about different characteristics of different regions or kind of you know, the, the industry there. structure, oh, because you, you you're right, you know, knowledge yeah. workers are, in, yeah. are becoming really expensive in the yeah. East Coast cities. Uh -huh. Yeah. So for a while, there was a big move kind of yeah. to the interior. Mm -hmm. That was part of it. Comment on that? Um, well, there's disparity among the, uh, the, the, the country. There's a disparity in price, uh, the, the wages, and the disparity in uh, loyalty to companies. Well, there's, uh, there's actually different parts of China has a lot of uh, specific characteristics. I'm just talking about generalization today. Mm -hmm. But if you go into details about Guangdong companies, there are the types of they, they, uh, industry they like to be in, the type of organization they are, characteristics, they're all very different. Go ahead. Uh, my question is not related to your presentation, which uh, is related to the uh, country China as a whole. Um, the, the Chinese products uh -huh. that are marketed or exported for developed countries and developed countries uh -huh. are not of the same standard. Uh, I can understand that, but okay, it is... Um, Please speak uh, louder. Sorry. The product, the product. standard and quality aspect uh -huh. of but the Chinese products. <coughs> Price, price performance, I think the Chinese product is the best. Two batteries and one explodes. You, know, uh -huh. it, it's not you still have a battery. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for two batteries, uh, it's uh, cheaper than the, the German one battery. Right? <laughs> so I think that a lot of early China growth was driven by the basic infrastructure growth uh -huh. of the economy. Uh -huh. And then really consumer spending has really been an engine for growth in the last maybe eight or nine years. Yeah. 
Are you seeing startup companies that are maybe looking for yet another kind of growth beyond that? Do you see them? Do you see kind of different business plans now? Than yes, you do? yes, yes. Consumer spending is uh, way up, and also because China is the biggest market in almost every product category. For example, cars. China sells more cars today than North America, yeah. and uh, China sells more cell phones than anywhere in the world. So that's why you guys talk about the Chinese products. In most of the product categories, almost all the product categories, China's market is dominated with domestic products. So that's why there's so many Chinese products. Because actually for these products, the most of the market is actually domestic. For example, phones. <laughs> it's very hard to buy a foreign phone. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, companies like Tencent have set up a VC arm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. do you think they can be successful investors? Yeah, I think so. Because they, they pay top dollars. And for these uh, very high quality startups, and uh, they give much higher valuation. For example, um, I think Berlusconi is going to sell AC Milan. Uh, and uh, they got bids for, like, say, five, 500 million. And the Chinese will be like, 650, <laughs> and Berlusconi is like, okay, <laughs> just all bid them. <laughs> it's simple, right? <laughs> I saw your hand first, okay. Now, maybe you can address the issue of intellectual property, which has come up, has that been changing over time? Uh, because one of the issues that comes up is, you know, the West and the United States has fairly aggressive protection um, of intellectual yeah. property. For patents? Patents. Uh, patents, patents are, are difficult to... Uh, enforced because uh, it's it's really a big argument. You know, even in the U.S., you know, people fight the patent all the time. Samsung and Apple, they fight each other, or with Google, etc. It takes a very long time. But with copyrights, China is uh, enforcing that more and more. If you if you do a pirate pirate website, you don't have much many uh, <laughs> uh, one of the pirate sites uh, pirate website. The the CEO of that uh, got arrested for a long time. Trademarks. Uh, trademarks, yeah. Trademarks and uh, copyrights. But that's easily enforceable. Mm -hmm. But for patents, it's hard to enforce anywhere. Go ahead. I have the same question, but oh, relating okay. specifically to intellectual patents. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the anecdote of being online to, mm -hmm. to Y Combinator or Denver, mm -hmm. and taking those ideas mm -hmm. and building a bunch of companies. And, mm -hmm. Uh, without any protection at all, how are these companies going to be successful? I mean, once they start yeah. to get traction... You mean the domestic companies, right? Pardon? You, you mean how can the company succeed with the... With no companies? protections at all of what they've built. Uh, in China, actually, as, as investors, we look more for execution capabilities rather than an idea. Because an idea is actually very cheap in China. <laughs> Because your idea will be copied everywhere, so why? <laughs> There's no value to the idea. There's more value to execution capabilities. <laughs> Actually, I think you could say the same thing around here. Here too, right? It's not it's really easy. that well known, but people really care about you know track record and as an indicator yeah. of likelihood that they'll yeah. do it the next time. There's a company in Europe called Rocket Internet. Have you guys heard of that company? It's a copycat galore. <laughs> So they copy everything from Uber, Airbnb to everything. This in, this uh, uh, European company. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they, they only, uh, the joke is that they only copy what's popular in the U.S. Well, the Chinese copy everything. <laughs> not, that was not, not even popular here. <laughs> you next. Uh, question about companies in China. Do you keep track of companies that do services for the tech industry, or maybe posts? tech industry, because you know, there's a lot of you know, repo type companies that deal with furniture and real estate and yeah. stuff. How has that been on the graph? Well, there's people working on everything. Well, whatever you can think of, someone's uh, doing a startup on it. <laughs> back in the back, go ahead. I was wondering, are you concerned about cyber terrorism and cyber, you know, disrupting things on a huge scale? I mean, it seems so... You, you mean uh, com your competitors, cyber, cyber or attack you? even, you know, terrorists going after a government or like like getting an atom bomb and explode. No, I mean, because no, we don't worry about that. Again, <laughs> I, I, I said, I wouldn't worry about the, the, the issue is too big for us to worry about. 
But if you worry about um, your competitor hacking your site, you don't have to worry about that because it's illegal to hack other people. If you can get evidence, you can arrest their CEO. So people, I mean, still, <laughs> you want to compete, right? You don't want to get arrested. <laughs> So there was one thing that you didn't mention in your differences between 1999 and 2015, and that is the existence of big, private, uh -huh. yeah. rapidly successful companies yeah. like Baidu and yeah. Alibaba and yeah. Tencent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How have the big three changed the, the landscape for startups in China? Uh, before, yeah. right, like, like a few years ago, they were a stranglehold yeah. for innovation. Sort of like Microsoft and Google, you know, they're like a stranglehold for innovation here. You know, like small companies, they do very well. And all of a sudden, Google does something, right? <laughs> Kills it. But um, today, Either that it? or they buy them. Is that or they buy them. And yeah. they force you, like, are you going to sell? You don't sell? No, I have the copy cut here. You know, it's like it's sort of like a, a forced sell. But um, uh, in China today, in these couple years, recently, because of massive entrepreneurship, they don't have a stranglehold anymore. The, the, the saying is that even if you're a lion, you could be eaten by the ants because there's too many of them. <laughs> I have to tell you that 10 years ago, uh, we had uh, Ju Min, who founded mm -hmm. WebEx, yeah. as one of our speakers in this series. Uh -huh. And he said that China is a jungle. It is a jungle. Silicon Valley is a zoo. The wild yeah. animals are here, but they're all in cages. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You can survive in China, you can survive anywhere. <laughs> Go ahead. One comment that I was going to make, and I really appreciate this picture that you painted for us, um, and, and that's, that's basically the change in the culture, you know, obviously promoted by the government mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. But the United States, have never, has, you know, we, didn't, we weren't able to do this, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even considered, it's barely considered necessary <coughs> in D.C. now, right? Mm -hmm. And Europe's trying to do it. They're trying to do culture change. China's actually doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're actually impregnating mm -hmm. entrepreneurship into the DNA mm -hmm. of the Chinese citizen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Well, the US is uh, because of the political structure here. Right, and it's very political. There's two parties, and you know, and every time you want to change. That's and the, 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 and if, you, if you make a rule in, in the US, it has, when it goes through Congress, the bill is going to be changed a lot by the time it's kind of out of Congress. But in China, it's very fast. Got two questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Which uh, smart device did you invest in uh, in the Silicon Valley that you could not find in, in China? Um, or AI that you could find in Silicon Valley that you could not find in China? Uh, and you mentioned a few companies here. Uh, one is called uh, VimoFit which is the number one uh, smartphone, uh, smart watch exercise app. Do a little ad. <laughs> I was just meeting the, the guy this, uh, this morning. And also I invested in a company called Impression Pie, which is the VR, AR, with the full hand recognition uh, glass uh, goggle. And uh, also I invested in uh, Goggle Pal, doing more ads. <laughs> it's, a, it's a ski uh, augmented reality uh, device. For the ski goggles. Also linked to, to um, hardware uh, up in, in China, these companies, right? No, 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 no. no. I, I don't. Uh, I, I tell them that uh, if you're if you're starting a company in the U.S., you should succeed in U.S. first. Don't get my money because you want to go to China, because I don't think you will survive there. <laughs> Just stay here, <laughs> stay here, and do well in the U.S. market. Do well on Kickstarter. Do well on Indiegogo. Don't worry about China. And once you become big enough. Uh, you can use my resources to get into China. But don't get into there now because, uh, like uh, no. Dasha said, you're in a zoo. <laughs> don't try to get into the jungle. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so how do you see the big Chinese companies, you know, successful companies like Baidu, Tencent, mm -hmm. uh, 360, how would they react to all these new entrepreneurs basically who will be coming up with new ideas to disrupt them? And they, uh, two, two ways they're going to uh, work with them. One is to invest, others to buy them. And that's only two ways. There's no way that you can destroy, destroy all of them. And plus, the problem with these three giants is that many of their top people, top quality people, are leaving them to start companies. So <laughs> that's the issue. They cannot keep them. <laughs>